Hi, I'm Susan Krumdike, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and um, Recovering Hydrogen Researcher. <laughs> and I'm being joined now by... Uh, Johan Lent. I am a process engineer specialized in corrosion, electrochemistry, and energy. And we're going to talk to you today about the scenarios part of the uh, in-time methodology. We're going to show you um, how we crash test a scenario to see if it makes sense. And we're going to do that with the hydrogen stories that we're all getting quite familiar with. So welcome to our crash test lab. Please keep your um, arms inside the car at all times and safety first. Buckle up. All right, why a crash test lab? Because you actually have to know what's going to happen. And so we call that the crash test. We take things for a road, um, a road test and see what happens. Now this is step three of the in-time methodology. Um, if you have a technology which is already well known, but you think it's going to be used in some new way, you have a new policy, then we use what's called a retro analysis, and we do have an example of that later on in the, in the program. What we're going to do here is the techno wedge. That's uh, you have your business as usual, and you think that you're going to change the emissions trajectory by adoption of a new technology. And that technology isn't yet really known, so we use engineering calculations um, to do the crash test. This is what it looks like. There's different barriers to adoption and to development that might stand between a great idea and um, the solution that meets our needs. It is possible to get over some of these development barriers with um, R&D investment, and that's just what we're going to test out. So the three stories that we want to look at today are, number one, we could use excess renewables to produce green hydrogen by electrolysis, we could store that hydrogen and then use the electricity when we need it. Great story. <laughs> um, the next story is that we could replace um, petroleum-based fuels with green hydrogen. That well, that's our star scenario. That's a star, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, lately we've also been talking about decarbonizing heat. And so we could also use hydrogen for that. So these should be quite familiar. Now let's see what the uh, crash test setup is that we've got here. We've got to look at the barriers. The first one is really fundamental science. If it doesn't get past that one. Do you break physics? We can go have a coffee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then we've got materials. Are there fundamental materials issues um, that uh, we need to get past? And the architecture just means the design of the thing itself. Um, are, there, are there any barriers there? Manufacturing, if it's going to be scaled up and rolled out, you've got to have the manufacturing for it. How does it integrate into the systems that already exist? And um, is there going to be a market for it once we get all those other hurdles um, over? So those are the those are the six things that I want you to pay attention to as we go along because these are the crash tests we need to do. First one, fundamentals based on energy. All right, so to run this test, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a, a hypothetical 100 megawatt hour wind turbine. In New Zealand right now, if we built a 100 megawatt uh, wind farm, then that would be excess power. We, we don't really need that right now. So that'll, that'll test our theory. Um, so we're going to run our wind farm for one hour at its full capacity. We're having one of those great windy days. And um, we're going to use the electricity in an electrolyzer. So the electrolyzer is all of this red stuff broken down into different um, components. We are going to compress the hydrogen once we make it and store it. Um, we're going to assume not for too long um, because then we'll put it back through the fuel cell and produce electricity when we need it. All right. So what we see is that we produce um, over this hour of great wind production 100 megawatt hours and we get out of that um, 26 megawatt hours of electricity. And that's just the basic energy balance on each of these components given how they work. So we can produce 2,000 kilograms um, of hydrogen in that time, and so that helps us um, size everything, but this is the facts. Now, um, maybe that's a good thing, right? I, I've got this wind power and I can produce um, hydrogen with it um, and then produce electricity, but let's look at the bill. Uh, I invest 160 million US in my wind farm and I could get uh, um, a certain amount of energy out of that. Um, now I've got to spend 10 million on my electrolyzer, 14 million on my compression and storage, and then 232 million on my fuel cell. 
Um, does this all seem doable? Uh, we do have wind farms on this scale in New Zealand. So Absolutely. I think the 100 megawatt wind farm, that's, that's not that's a big West deal these days. Almost. How about the 100 megawatt um, uh, electrolyzer? Well, the biggest one on the planet that would be in Germany is of the order of 10 megawatts. So we need a lot oh. of the biggest units whether they're made. Can, mm. can we upscale it, maybe? That sounds a bit dodgy. Yeah. All right. Um, well, as long as we've got the costs here, let's look exactly. at those. Um, if I built my wind farm, I would be investing uh, at a rate of about uh, $1,600 per kilowatt. And that's, you know, that's pretty normal. But to then get one fourth of the electricity out of that system, I would have to spend 10 times more. I'm starting to see a bit of a crash here on this reasoning. Let's continue. It's just okay. money, right? It's just money. <laughs> you could get a subsidy. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the energy fundamentals. You have an economy, and that economy has to invest to build energy transformation systems. So if you invest 5.5 um, units of embedded energy and um, commercial energy, to interact with 730 units of wind power, you can produce 100 units of electricity. Now that means that given grid losses, you have 68 units for the economy to do what it likes. And that gives you an EROI, energy return on energy invested, of about 12. Which is a decent That's not bad. ROI. I'd take it, I'd do that deal. All right, now let's come over and look at the wind power. But now we're investing that 100 units of wind power plus what we had to invest to actually build the wind farm, um, plus what we had to invest in the hydrogen and the fuel cells. And of course we got our, our losses. That gives us 26 units left for the economy. So we had to invest uh, 133.5 units of energy to get 26. Mm. That's not a good deal. That's a starved economy. Mm. Nothing works uh, without a profit. That, that's not a profit. That's not an energy profit. So that, folks, is what we call a deal breaker. Um, okay, well, let's look at the heating. If we don't produce the electricity, cut out that fuel cell bit. That was a, that was a loser there, the fuel exactly. cell. So we cut Terrible that. Terrible efficiency. All right. Um, let's just use the green, the green hydrogen for heat. We can just take the hydrogen and put it into our, our gas boilers. Um, and gas furnaces. All right, let's start again with our 100 megawatt wind farm. We're gonna run it for an hour and we're gonna use that uh, electricity to, or sorry, we're, we're gonna use the electricity to make hydrogen yes. and then that's gonna go into a boiler. That would give us uh, 46 megawatt hours uh, return of heat. Thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, yes. So 40, okay. If I just use the 100 megawatts in a resistant heater, how much heat would I get? hundred. Hundred megawatts. <laughs> okay, so it's not. It's I'm getting half of what I would if I if I just used a resistance heater. Mm. Now, what if I invested in a heat pump? Uh, I I'm taking a lot of risks by putting hydrogen into my gas design. Exactly. and you'd have to replace equipment. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I could actually because the coefficient of performance, basic thermodynamics of a heat pump, I could I could get um, 270 megawatt hours of heat out of the heat pump. Now the question is the, the intermittency of the wind. When does it when is it there? When is it not? Well, if we had decent buildings, they can actually store heat in them. They have a lot of thermal capacity. So we could run our heat pumps when we have wind and store the heat in our buildings. So I actually think that that's a much better deal than, than the hydrogen. Exactly. That's hmm. that's a no-brainer. All right, but let's go talk about the fun one. The big one. Because <laughs> this is the one that just, oh, it, it gets it's our everywhere. imagination. Because we know the cars are, that's exactly. where so much of our emissions is. Mm. So let's start again with our 100 megawatt wind farm. But let's run it all year. And that will give us 240 gigawatt yep. hours of energy. With your standard utility factor. Yeah, yeah. That's what you get. So that energy is now going to be used to produce green hydrogen in the system that we used before. And that means that a car like this Toyota Mirai, um, driven the, the standard uh, average amount that, that Kiwis drive, 12,000 kilometers a year or so, uh, would require about 126 um, kilograms of hydrogen. 
The car right now costs around 83,000. So if we wanted to buy enough of them to be fueled by our wind farm, we could buy 34,000 cars, Johan. That's a lot of cars. That's a lot of cars and money. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so that's pretty good, 1% of our fleet. So we could reduce our carbon emissions from our uh, personal vehicle fleet by 1% if we invested 2.8 billion in cars, Great. plus the, mm, what was it, uh, 100, 200 and some million in the wind farm and the electrolyzer. Um, great. And then the petrol stations, et cetera. Oh, yeah, that yeah, cost that is too. just the oh, cost. I haven't put that in yet. Um, let's see. We got to invest in our wind farm, invest in our electro electrolyzers. Uh, okay. I think maybe the deal breaker here is that 2.8 billion to get a 1% reduction in emissions. I tell you what, you give some of our transition engineers 2.8 billion and we'll get you a lot more than 1% reduction on, on emissions, I tell you what. And uh, that 34,000 cars is a lot more than Toyota Marais that have ever been built. Exactly. So there's Over something the wrong with this years. story. I know, I know they can scale up, they can make lots of them. Okay, maybe they can. Maybe that's a barrier that can be overcome. But I still think the deal isn't looking all that so good. So far, that's a manufacturing crash. Yeah, yeah. And, and we continue further with the resources needed in order to make a fuel cell and an electrolyzer. For that, you need platinum. You cannot do without it. It's a chemical that you need for a whole bunch of chemical and physical reason. We're not going to go through that, but you need that material. Now, in electrochemistry, we talk about platinum loading, how much platinum you need in order to obtain a certain power in your fuel cell. So for something that has the power size of the Toyota Mirai car, you would need around 30 grams of platinum. Now, sure, as engineers, we love uh, challenges. So we could try to lower that number towards 10 grams per car. But anyway, let's remember that 30. Now, where is platinum coming from? How do we get it? It turns out every year we can manage to get around 200 tons of platinum. The vast majority of that platinum is coming from one country, South Africa. And half of that is used already by the car industry for catalytic converters. Now, the thing is the production has already peaked in platinum and you don't extract platinum just by itself. Platinum is actually a byproduct of other mining industries like uh, silver and, um, and nickel. Okay, New Zealand, 4 million cars. If we would like to replace that with hydrogen vehicles, you would almost need a whole year's worth of platinum production. Okay, and now there are 1.4 billion cars on the planet. At the current extraction rate, which has already peaked, let's remember that, we would need decades and decades of platinum production. We do not have enough platinum and we do not have the time. So that's a pretty big crash. It's, it's what we call a materials limit. Exactly. And also this 30 grams or so that's in the proton exchange membrane fuel cells is not recoverable. Exactly. It's spread out in nanoparticles um, so diffusely that you really can't recover it. Exactly. You can recover the uh, catalytic converter platinum. Because it's in a metal, therefore the process is better. You can bring it For out. a fuel cell, it's a composite material, which makes recycling horrible. Yeah. This seems like a deal breaker right here. A big one. So when you hear transition engineers saying, I'm not really going to talk about the hydrogen for cars and hydrogen for fuel cells because it doesn't make sense and it's not going to happen. It's because they can do a little bit of math. Exactly. <laughs> All right. And besides that, look, there's stuff we've known for decades that hydrogen interacts with metals in ways yeah. that causes failures. And when you're talking about containing hydrogen in vessels and pipes, those failures are not the thing you want to talk about. It's called exactly. hydrogen embrittlement, already known. It's so leaky, it's going to soften and yeah. crack. 
most metals. Which is why we don't have these things yet. All right, and probably won't ever. So uh, let's talk about the system integration just for a second. Um, we would need filling stations for these vehicles. And um, right now, Germany is the second highest number of filling stations on the planet. They have 80. They don't actually sell hydrogen cars, they will lease them. Um, New Zealand, little old New Zealand has 1300 filling stations. So this whole system, what we've gotten used to of being able to go wherever we want, fill up whenever we want, um, have total mobility and freedom, that is not what the hydrogen system looks like. So if you're talking about replacing the systems we've got now with something that's just fueled by green hydrogen, that's just not really a thing that's going to happen. You can talk about it a lot. Yeah. There's you no barrier to talking. You can make roadmaps <laughs> road road and reports. Yes, more reports. Exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, pathways, whatever you like. No shortage of that. But if you do the math, what you see is that really um, our crash test has shown that renewable energy is not free. You do have to pay for it. Hydrogen is not an energy source. The energy penalty for taking off um, renewable electricity, putting it through the hydrogen storage, and then bringing it back as electricity is not justified. Nobody's going to do that. Energy return on energy invested? It's just horrible. Deal breaker. <laughs> um, platinum availability? Simple no. Material limit. The planet is finite. <laughs> Hydrogen embrittlement, same thing we've known for a long time. Can't break mm -hmm. physics. No, safety problems. Yeah. And what about market adoption? Are we going to spend 10 times more to do exactly the same thing, no new benefits, um, to get one fourth of the value? Uh, mm, doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make sense. So our hydrogen fuel cell test uh, has failed. It doesn't pass, but then. What do we do? What are we going to do? Um, stay tuned. Shift, Shift projects. projects. <laughs> Let's do that. Cool.